Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn with me to Psalm 103, verse 2. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And verse 3 says, Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. What I have been sharing with you these last few sessions is the reality that you must receive. God wants you well. God's desire for you is for you to be well. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be free of sickness. He wants you to be free of addiction. He wants you to be free from torment and pain. God wants you well. Now you may say, why in the world would that be an issue? It's because much of the teaching of the church over the last few centuries has been that possibly God put this on you to teach you something. Possibly, you can learn something through this. I've actually had people tell me, well, I got to witness to the doctor. Well, God doesn't have to make you sick to witness to the doctor. Wouldn't a better witness be when they call and say it's time for your appointment, you go in and get checked over and there's nothing wrong? And the doctor says to you, my goodness, you are so healthy. That gives you the opportunity to say, well, bless the Lord, O my soul. He not only forgave my sins, but He heals all my diseases. Well, does God want you well? Yes, He does. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15, verse 23. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And he cast it into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Now somebody may say, well, there is a place where God puts diseases on somebody. Not his people. Now we could could spend a week talking of the theological aspects of this, but not his people. He heals those who diligently heed the voice, his voice. And they listen to the commandments. Now this is under the old covenant. This is under the old covenant. But you cannot forget that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and God is the one who never changes. He says, I am the Lord thy God, who who does not change. So what God liked 5,000 years ago, He liked it 2,000 years ago, and He likes it now. What He didn't like 5,000 years ago, He didn't like it 2,000 years ago, and He doesn't like it now. Somebody may say, well, but the law says it's legal. It doesn't matter what the law says. That doesn't change what God likes and what God doesn't like. Now, the grace of God that we are living in right now is a wonderful time. Because right now we have something that they didn't have back when the Hebrews came out of Egypt. We have the blood of Jesus. When Jesus put his blood on the altar, he paid the price in full for your sin. He paid the price in full for your salvation. Now let me ask you this. Is everyone saved on the earth? Is everyone saved? Is everyone born again? The answer is no. Of course they're not. 
But the price has been paid for everyone to be saved if they will receive it. The price has been paid. So let's say, for example, we have somebody come into the church or you meet them at some place or they're a friend of yours or a relative and they, they decide that they want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let's say, let's go to the extreme. Let's say they've been an atheist all their life. Let's say they've cursed God. They've hated God. And then they decide they want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They, they see the light. They, they understand. Jesus, now, now follow me on this, Jesus does not need to crawl back up onto the cross and die again for them. Why? Because he has already been on the cross and died once and for all and paid the price for all eternity for everyone's salvation. It's no different with our sin. He's paid the price for our sin. Is everyone sinless and living without sin consciousness? No. But the price has been paid for our sin. Every born again believer can, can, we are made righteous. And if we choose to believe that, we can understand what his blood did. Likewise, our healing has been paid for. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2.24 that by the stripes of Jesus we have been healed. Everything has been covered. We have been healed. 1 Peter 2.24 does not tell us we will be healed. 1 Peter 2.24 tells us we have been healed. It's the same principle. Jesus took stripes on his body for our healing. If you need healing, in the same way that if somebody's lost and they need Jesus, Jesus doesn't need to climb back up on the cross and die again. He paid the price once and for all. In the same way, he doesn't need to take stripes on his body again so you can be healed. Why? Because he's already done it. The price has been paid. By the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. Not will be, you were. Now what does it take to get saved? You've got to receive it. That's why we call it receiving salvation. It's the same principle with healing. You must receive your healing. Now, what does it take to get saved? Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace we have been saved through faith. Through faith. Well, how do we get faith? So then faith comes by hearing. Romans 10.17 Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we hear the Word of God believe the Word of God, and we receive our salvation. How do we get healed? The same way. We hear the Word of God on healing, we believe it and receive it, and we're healed. You say, well, that sounds way too simple. That's what people say when you tell them they can have everlasting life and all they've got to do is receive Jesus. They go, that's too simple. And that's why religion has it set up so that we have to do something. Most religions have it set up to where you have to do something to get saved. you got to say so many of this. you got to do this. you got to do that. you gotta, you got to fast. you got to... And they, they go through all this rigmarole that you got to do to get saved. Let me tell you something. If you do anything to get saved, what you're doing is you're saying that Jesus didn't do enough. If you, if you say, I have to do this in order to get saved, you're saying that Jesus didn't pay the price in full. There's a little bit of the price left to pay. And it's my job to pay it. You're putting yourself on the equal with Jesus. No, Jesus paid the price in full for your salvation. And he paid the price in full for your healing. Now, why is it that it's harder to get healed than it is to get saved for most people. Because salvation is not something you have to see. But healing has to do with the senses. And that's why we are told 
we walk by faith and not by sight. You've got to believe what God says about your salvation in order to get saved. You need to believe what He says about your healing in order to get healed. And that's why I'm putting so much emphasis on this point. It's God's will for you to be well. He wants you well. Jesus said, now listen to this. Jesus said that he did not do anything unless the Father spoke it. He said, I have never said anything and I've never done anything unless the Father spoke it first. Well, what is it that Jesus did? He went about town to town, village to village, healing all who were sick and oppressed of the devil. Well, what does that mean? That means the Father must have told him to do it. So it's God's will for you to be healed. Jesus never made anyone sick. All right. Are you ready? You've got to see sickness for what it is. It's a curse. Galatians 3.13, the Scripture tells us that Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law. Under the Old Covenant, if you did this, you were cursed, and if you did this, you were healed. And, that was, and if you it didn't follow all the, the statutes, you were cursed, and you got sick. Now let me tell you something. I'm a good guy. You're good people. But there's not a person in this room that hasn't sinned in the last few hours. You say, well, I don't sin. Well, look, there's the Big Ten. You can go out there in the atrium and they're written on the wall, the Big Ten, the Big Ten Commandments. Well, yeah, but there's 603 other commandments plus a whole lot of things that the Lord told us. He said, you obey the laws of the land. As I said last week, you travel 56 miles an hour in a 55 mile, mile an hour zone. You have broke the law. You didn't do what Jesus said, and you sinned. You say, well, that was just a little sin. It's a sin. You, you cannot live perfect enough to get yourself saved. Likewise, you cannot live perfect enough to get yourself healed. Now, don't be a doofus and go around and drink Diet Cokes and eat Twinkies all day long, every, every day, every meal, and, and expect your body to just run at top efficiency. Because, you know, Jesus will heal me. So, what are you having for lunch? Twizzlers and a Coke. What are you having for dinner? Ice cream and cake. No, we, we have wisdom. We have common sense. We are told to take care of the body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Take care of it. We're told that. But there's nothing you can do to make you saved. And there's nothing you can do to make you healed. We need the blood of Jesus. We need the healing power of Him. And we live in the age of grace. So he came to redeem us from the curse of the law. Remember that word propitiation? He, he died so that we can live. He took on sickness and disease so that we can have health and healing. And he took on poverty. That's not our subject today, but I can show you where he took on poverty so that we could have prosperity. There are three parts to the curse of the law. Death, sickness and disease, and poverty. And he came to redeem us from all of that. Well, what do we do now that we're under the new covenant, we're under the covenant of grace, Jesus said this. He said, all the law can be summed up into this one thing. The love you have for one another. We live under the commandment of love. What does that mean? That means if you love your brother, you're not going to steal from your brother. 
If you love your brother, you're not going to kill your brother. If you love your brother, you're not going to sleep with his wife. If you love your... And, and it goes on. It, love covers a multitude of sins. So, under the new covenant, what we receive is based upon what Jesus has done and not based upon what we have done. It, it's based upon what we can believe. And we need to understand this. God wants you well. And God is not trying to teach you something by making you sick. Sickness is like a snake in your house. Now, my son, Robbie, we were having dinner one day, and I asked him to get something out of the freezer. And this was in our, our lake house. He went out into the garage and down the stairs into the, to the garage area where the freezer was to get something out of the freezer. And he was a, a teenager, big teenager, but he stepped on a snake in our garage in his bare feet. Well, immediately he was back up the steps and he was in the house. And we had a decision to make. Are we going to sit down and eat our dinner and let that snake run around our house? Inside our house? And then after dinner, maybe we might go looking for it. No. The war was on. The two ladies in the house hid in the bedroom. The one man and his teenage son. <laughs> we, got a, we got a hoe. We got a rake. We, we got a pistol, <laughs> and we went snake hunting. And now that snake, was, it was a big snake, and it had found its way up under the refrigerator. Well, I didn't know that. I'm walking around. I've, I've got this stick. I'm, you know, I've got my snake stick, and I'm walking around looking for it. Now, I don't know it, but my toes are right up next to the refrigerator. Now, I'm walking around. I don't realize that there's a space like this. Under, I said refrigerator. I meant freezer. It's one of those big... You know, box freezers. And I don't know that snake's under there. And I feel that thing rub up against my toe. I still have all my toes, but there's still marks in the concrete to this day. <laughs> I'm telling you, I hate snakes. I hate snakes. The only good snake's a dead snake. I know you can tell me, oh, there's good snakes. There's no good snake. They don't exist. I don't care if they're eight foot long or that long. They're dead if they come near my property. What kind of snake was that? Dead snake. So next thing I know, I'm up on top of the freezer. <laughs> and Robbie is saying, what do we do? I said, look under the freezer. <laughs> so, so he determines it's under the freezer. Now he's in the house with the girls. I'm, I'm out there, and I got a piece of conduit, and I'm up on top of that freezer. You know, I camped out there. I think, man, that snake's got to come out. You know, I don't care how long it takes. And I'm watching. And he stuck his head out. It's the last thing he ever saw. <laughs> Boom! Mm. Now, how long do you hold a snake's head? And, and they can wiggle for a long time. But not with their head cut off. And I tell you what. You find a snake in your house, you've got to get rid of it. You don't say, well, it's over there under the couch someplace. Let's watch some TV and then we'll get it. No! <laughs> it doesn't work that way in my house. The devil's a snake. Sickness is a snake. You've you got you to think of sickness the same way that you think of a snake getting into your house. What do you do? You get out the Word of God. You start listening to the Word of God. And you listen, and you listen, and you listen, and you listen, and you listen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You got a sickness in your body? Listen to healing scriptures. Find some people that teach on healing. Listen to the sermons over and over. Get that Word in you. You need to know God wants you well. He wants that snake dead. God doesn't want that snake in your house anymore, and you want that snake in your house. 
And if you're living with a snake in your house, wake up. Everybody stretch your hands out over this stretch. Your hands. All right. Luke 13:11. Luke 13:11. You know, there is so much about healing that I have honestly I'm I'm not joking. I have probably got 20 pages of notes that I'm not going to get to today. We will get to them. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Now I'm sure if this lady was living today and she went to the doctor, the doctor's not going to say, oh, we've we've tested you, ma'am. You've got a spirit of infirmity. No, that's not what they're going to say. They're going to say, you've got scoliosis, you've got you know, you got this ligament, this tendon, this vertebrae thing. They'll come up with all kinds of things, but they're not going to say you have a spirit of infirmity. What has changed since Jesus was here? Nothing. We are, we are living under the age of grace. The same, the same things that Paul the Apostle dealt with, we're dealing with. Now, there was a woman with a spirit of infirmity. How long had she had it? 18 years. That's a long time to have a snake under your refrigerator and was bent over, and in no way could raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, now you're going to see something here that is a little different than what is taught in most places. Almost every place that you go and you you hear about healing, and I, I, I respect these teachers, they're good, they're good people. They say you always have to Go and call for the elders. Like it says in James, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. And they say, if you don't call for the elders, well, look what Jesus did here. But when Jesus saw her, he called her. Now I think that's a typical example of how Jesus is calling out the sick people and he's calling them and he's saying, hey, remove the fog. There's a snake in your house. Get out the word that will kill the snake and start developing the snake-killing word that I've given you. Okay. He called to her. He called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. All right. Verse 13. And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. And you're going to find this. You're going to have Christians. When you start talking about how God heals you, when you start talking about it's God's will that we be healed, you're going to get a lot of, yeah, but, oh, well, I understand that. Yeah, I know God heals, but you know this situation, they've, just, they've been that way for. 18 years. Well, it doesn't matter if they've been that way for 18 minutes or 18 years. It didn't matter to Jesus. Don't ever give in. Don't ever get to the point where you say, well, you know, I think I can live with this. You know, I, you know what we need to do? We just need to kind of like build a little fence around that place that goes out into the garage so that the snake can't get in any further. No, no, don't partition off an area for the snake. Kill that puppy. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jews had healed on the Sabbath. People are going to come up with reasons why you shouldn't be healed. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. Well, she didn't come necessarily to be healed Jesus saw her and I'll tell you what he's looking at you it doesn't matter what day of the week it is he's looking at you and he is saying come on come here and the Lord answered and said to her verse 15 hypocrite (laughs) when I was a kid I used to think that was a small hippopotamus I did 
You know, what's a hypocrite? Well, it's a little baby hippopotamus. Okay. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead him away and water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, now, now, now look at this. Here's where the sickness came from. Remember, she had an infirmity, which means sickness. Look what it says. What does it say? Whom Satan has bound. I'm telling you, the source of your sickness and disease is not God. God is not putting something on you to teach you something. He's not trying to bring you into a better place. He's not going to beat you down to humble you. Like one guy who was sick told me one day, well, you can't look up until you're flat on your back. It's dumb, dumb, dumb. Dumb, 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 dumb. Dum, 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 dum. Okay. For 18 years, oh man, Satan has bound for 18 years. Now Jesus is talking here. He said, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound. And then Jesus said this. Think about this. Think about this. For 18 years. You may have been bound by sickness for who knows how long. You may have been bound by addiction for who knows how long. You may be bound by stress and pain for who knows how long. But it doesn't matter how long. Jesus says, think about it. Quit it now. Don't let it be 19 years. Be loosed from this bond. Okay, if you're bound, what's bondage is like prison. Loosed is like get out of jail. Free. And I'm saying today, get loosed. I'm saying today, be healed. And the healing power of God is in you. You know what you don't need to get healed? You don't need another person. Now the Bible says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint with oil. But, you know what's, you know what's best? That's, that's almost like that's a last-ditch effort. You know what's best? To walk in health and healing and to know your authority and to speak the words yourself and say, I bind you sickness and disease from my body. I curse you. Jesus said, speak to the mountain. Did Jesus pray to God here? No, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not against prayer. You, you guys know that. I'm very strong on prayer. But did he pray? Or did he just command? He took his authority because he knew who he was. And we have, Jesus said, the same things I do, you will do. In fact, you're going to do some greater things than I have done. And so if we walk in the anointing, he told us to speak to the mountain. That mountain may be your sickness. It may be your disease. It may be your poverty. It may be your addiction. Whatever it is, you speak to it. And you say, poverty, addiction, disease, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you and I'm zeroed in on your head. And in the name of Jesus, thunk, you're dead. Snake, you're not allowed in my house. No snakes in my house. You don't put up with a snake. You say, well, it's just a little snake. Well, you know, pythons are about that big when they're born. 25-foot python starts out like that. And in 18 years, they can really grow. Stand up. In the name of Jesus, repeat after me. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim... That I have been healed. I I speak to the mountain. I speak to to sickness and disease. I speak to to poverty. I speak to addiction. addiction. And I say you have no place. place. Slithering around. (laughs) In my house. house. It's my house. house. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I I rebuke you. I I curse you. And I command you to be dead and gone now in the name of Jesus.
and believe what you said. Remember what he said in Mark eleven twenty three. 23? You speak to that mountain and you believe that the words you speak will come to pass. You will have whatever you speak. That's what he said. Father, in the name of Jesus, I proclaim over this great congregation here that Your Word is true and has come to pass in their life right now. There are pains that are leaving. There are diseases and cancers that are dissolving. There is afflictions, addictions, They're just going away because they've been loosed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.